Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Daniel Mattingly. He is an assistant professor of political science at Yale who studies the political economy of development and authoritarian politics with a focus on China. His current work examines the role of the military, nationalism, and surveillance technology in Chinese politics. Today we'll talk with Professor Mattingly about his new book, The Art of Political Control in China. Welcome, Professor Mattingly. Thank you so much for having me. So let's begin with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. Absolutely. So my book looks at the sort of hidden side of political control in China. So what motivates the book is an interest in, in understanding China and China's rise, which I think is one of the most interesting, exciting stories of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So you have in China a country where over 800 million people have lifted themselves out of dollar-a-day poverty into the global middle class. And at the same time, you have a state that's uh, implemented these ambitious, far-reaching policies of social control and social engineering. So mm -hmm. I think an example that most people in the United States would be familiar with is the one-child policy, which right. limited the number of children that people could have. But there have been also a number of other policies, especially policies around uh, property rights and, uh, and lands mm -hmm. uh, that have also sort of deeply re reached deeply into, into society um, and, and changed it. So the, the question that I'm interested in with the book is, how has the state implemented these ambitious, far-reaching policies of social engineering while at the same time controlling protest? Mm -hmm. uh, and the basic answer that I have in the book is that it's not just about the police. So I think in the West, often when we think about authoritarian regimes, we have this image of authoritarian regimes controlling society through the police and through coercion. And that certainly happens in mm -hmm. China. So I think uh, an important example in China is what's happening in the western part of China in the province of Xinjiang, which is a uh, region of China that's inhabited by uh, Uyghurs, a, a Muslim ethnic minority. Okay. And uh, over a million people have been uh, uh, sent to re-education camps in Xinjiang, an extremely kind of coercive policy. So there's mm -hmm. been some uh, good reporting on this in the New York Times and other outlets. Uh, so my research, so that certainly happens in authoritarian regimes, including right. China. My research, though, focuses on uh, this more sort of hidden tools that the state uses, even in places like Xinjiang, but certainly throughout China, mm -hmm. to control so, uh, society. So the surprising thing that I find in my book is that uh, civil society groups, local grassroots social organizations, are sort of great tools for the state to uh, influence, control, and monitor society. Mm -hmm. So grassroots social organizations that in other contexts we might think are useful for organizing and holding leaders accountable are in an authoritarian context like China actually quite useful for the state to implement policies mm -hmm. like the one child policy or land requisitions while maintaining political stability. Okay, and uh, so we will unpack all of that in a minute, but I am curious to know what led you to be interested in this. Absolutely, so I, so I was a Yale undergrad back mm -hmm. in the day and after I graduated from Yale I went and, and lived in China, uh, so if there are Yale undergrads watching, I guess. There are some great programs at Yale to go uh, study and, and live in China mm -hmm. after you graduate. So I took advantage of uh, some of these programs while I was an undergrad at Yale, lived in China, and I think in, when I was in China, uh, starting in the mid-2000s, Where were uh, you? I was in Hunan province, which okay. is sort of in the, the southeastern, southwestern part of China. So it's kind of sort of, if you overlay China on the United States, sort of where Arkansas is. Oh, okay. Um, so and why did you go there? Uh, so I did a program actually through Princeton called Princeton in Asia that sent me uh, that sent me to Hunan Province. Uh, Yale, okay. the Yale China Association also has a great program that sends teachers mm -hmm. uh, to the same province to teach. Right, right. Um, so I just happened to be sent to that province, which is a great sort of fascinating introduction to China. This is a part of China that was developing really rapidly when I went there. Okay. Uh, so I mean, I think so. Some of my good friends, uh, who's uh, even a generation ago, you know, their parents. Mm -hmm. uh, weren't able to have meat every week uh, because, uh, you know, not just because of the Great Leap Forward, but because it was a relatively poor area of China. Sure. Uh, by the time I was there in the mid 2000s, not only were they you know, putting bacon on the table every mm -hmm. day, uh, but but people were starting to buy cars, uh, had nice apartments, and were sort of starting to enter enter the middle class. Mm -hmm. So seeing this was sort of fascinating. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, just down the road, uh, there were people who, uh, as part of these local state-led development projects, uh, people who are being forced from their lands and weren't very happy about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, China, I think like the United States, is a big country full of contradictions and so sort of seeing on the one hand this rapid development, which is really what's behind the rise of China on the, on the world stage, sure. and on the, on the other hand, uh, people who 
were, in this case, trying to fight for their land, fight for their property, um, and uh, uh, was, was something that fascinated me. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of led to directly into this book project and okay. understanding the roots of political control. Mm -hmm. And how did you do the research for the book? So for the book, I uh, went and did field research in a number of villages in China. So this involved uh, partly going in and living there again. Uh, while Still in the Hunan area or a different part of China? So I did go to, I did go to Hunan province mm -hmm. as for part of my research. And also I spent some time in Guangdong province, uh, Jiangsu, and, and Hunan. So I went to four different provinces, but most of my research was focused in uh, the southern province of Guangdong, which is next to uh, next to Hong Kong, mm -hmm. um, and actually next to Hunan. But I did I did go back to Hunan to do it uh, to do research. So I so I took a multi method approach. So I did a couple of things. First, I went to and stayed for a while and mm -hmm. interviewed people in some of these villages uh, to try to understand uh, how the process of uh, local development and land requisition happened. Uh, I was especially interested mm -hmm. in uh, land rights and how. Uh, farmers and the rural poor can ensure that they have access to land that's theirs, and if the state decides to requisition and redevelop it, that they mm -hmm. can get good compensation. Um, and just to try to understand the politics of these villages and what uh, what caused people to mobilize or not mobilize in in protests. So I combined the sort of boots on the ground, I guess, mm -hmm. um, almost ethnographic approach with collecting data. So I also did uh, survey research across a number of villages in China. And so kind of using this quantitative data and the qualitative data, I was able to triangulate mm -hmm. um, on, on an answer for how it is that the state has been able to requisition land and implement the one-child policy without encountering you know, widespread protest in all right. cases. Okay, so what did you determine? How are they able to do that? I'm particularly interested in the one-child rule. And is, is that still in existence today? I thought I had read that it's, that it's not, but it is? No, so, so the f Chinese family planning policies have been modified. Okay, um, that's what I thought I heard, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it was never, it's called the one-child policy in, in the West, but it was, first of all, in China, it was never a blanket one-child policy. So oh, there, okay. there have often been exceptions. Uh, policies are different in different provinces and even to a certain extent in different, in different counties. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are exceptions carved out um, for people who are ethnic minorities or people who, in some cases, if you have a daughter as your first child, you might uh, be able to have a second child, especially if you live in a, in a rural uh, part of China. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah, so the one-child policy, I mean, I think is in many ways uh, maybe an emblem in the West of uh, social engineering and social control right. in an authoritarian regime like China. And I think in, I mean, it's, it's an interesting policy because I think in a lot of urban China, it has a lot of political legitimacy. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. would probably have willingly only had one child anyway. Uh, and people, uh, I think, so, so people in some sense saw the need for it. It's a much less popular policy in rural China, uh, partly for economic reasons. It's just mm -hmm. more useful to have more children sure. if, you're, if you're farming or yes. if you need to send uh, children to cities to work and then uh, remit your wages back right. home. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a much less popular in rural China policy in rural China, which is what I was focusing on. So the kind of puzzle there is why, mm -hmm. do, people, why do people in rural China comply with this anyway? Okay. And so one answer to this is, is coercion. Uh, but, and, uh, but another piece to this, which is the piece that I explore, which I think social scientists have thought about less, is the non-coercive side of mm -hmm. it, which is the way that the state uses social organizations okay. to try to influence and control Okay, people. and let's talk about that. How do they use um, those things? What are some of the strategies that they employ to kind of covertly control um, the people? So. I talk about three different strategies in my book. Mm -hmm. The first is using local social, social organizations, especially local civil society organizations, as a tool, direct tool okay. of social control. And so in rural, oh, go ahead. Uh, tell us what a, um, a, a civil um, group is, so a civil the, society the, group. The sorts of civil society groups that I look at in my project mm -hmm. are mostly rural s social organizations. So you could think of temple associations, okay. you know, folk religious organizations that might, uh, that have uh, local uh, temple groups, uh, lineage associations. These, these are kinship networks okay. uh, that might create uh, a local association and have mm -hmm. an ancestral hall with uh, uh, ancestral tablets to venerate and celebrate uh, their ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, more kind uh, sort of traditional f uh, uh, 
folk music groups are another kind of uh, social organization. Mm -hmm. uh, All right, so it sounds at. like a, a very diverse, a diverse group. So how do they tap those organizations to kind of manipulate what they what they want to happen? So uh, there are a few different ways, um, and it's not completely, I don't want to paint the picture okay. that it's completely insidious, okay, uh, that it's a completely ins <laughs> uh, insidious uh -huh. uh, uh, process. process. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times right, these are organizations that people of course are genuinely interested mm -hmm. in um, sure. and interested in starting. So especially, so China in the 50s, 60s, and 70s when Mao Zedong was in power uh, abolished a lot of these groups and tried to get rid of them. They sort of reconstituted or were revived starting mm -hmm. in the 1980s. Um, and even though China as a communist country is sort of nominally, uh, or at least uh, tries to discourage uh, religion and some of these local uh, civic organizations. Uh, however, as I think in the 80s when these groups, and 90s when these groups were getting started again, local officials often saw them as useful uh, for them mm -hmm. uh, because the existence of this local group meant two things. One, if you have members of these groups, it's a little bit easier to uh, to monitor them and see what's going on. So if you have people regularly coming and going to one of these temples or mm -hmm. ancestral halls, just makes them a little bit easier to monitor. I think it's also especially useful because these groups often have leaders who then have social influence. Mm -hmm. And this informal social influence is really useful for officials when they want to implement policy. So if you want to convince somebody that they should comply with a one-child policy, or if right. you want to convince somebody that they should move off their land so the village can build a new uh, factory, it's useful to have these socially influential allies mm -hmm. who can help per persuade you uh, to move people off their land. So I think it's it's more a process of sort of allowing these groups to uh, to flourish right. because they're useful for, mm -hmm. uh, for but, local But leads. describe how the groups are actually, I'm, I'm curious to know like, does the, con does the government contact one person in the group and says, hey, you know, we kind of want this or that to happen? I mean, how does the process actually work? I'm curious, the very nitty gritty of that. The nitty gritty of it. So, so it's often a kind of organic, an organic process mm -hmm. that, uh, that happens over time. So you, can have, you, uh, you might have in a village uh, the leader, for example, of a local lineage group. Again, these are kind of extended kinship networks, so you mm -hmm. can think of as essentially clans. Okay. Um, and uh, the leader of this kinship group might have been someone who sort of emerged over time as just somebody who was unusually competent and authoritative, mm -hmm. uh, someone to whom others in the group would go to to sort of ask for advice, to try to get a job, uh, to sort of ask what the, what's the right social etiquette for putting on a wedding, and you know, how many pounds of mm -hmm. rice do I need to bring okay. to the bride. Uh, and so you, in a lot of villages, you have somebody uh, who is maybe the kind of informal or de facto leader of this of this kinship network? Mm -hmm. uh, once that person emerges, it's it can be kind of a kind of natural process then for local political leaders like the Communist Party secretary of the village, who's uh -huh. sort of the most uh, powerful political figure in a village in China, for this person to seek out uh, this socially influential person and say, "Well, well listen, I need to. Uh, we need to take." Uh, land from the following five uh, farmers who are in your, who are in your clan uh, or because we need to build a road or because we need to put in a, you know, a power transformer mm -hmm. or it's something. It's like eminent domain in this country. Exactly. It's, it's like similar. eminent domain, right, but yeah. you have to get people to actually comply <laughs> right. with it. Uh -huh. um, and especially if you're not offering compensation at, at the market rate, which right. is generally what happens or what mm -hmm. happens in a lot of these cases, especially in rural China. Okay. Um, so, so it's useful to have these Local elites as mm -hmm. as social as allies right. for the state to help uh, to help implement these policies right, right. and a more kind of direct. Oh, go ahead. And then would it be an honor for the people who comply with the request? I mean, culturally, how would they be looked upon by the rest of the the group? Well, I think that in general, uh, the reason it's useful to have these allies is mm -hmm. because they do have social authority. So I'm not sure it's exactly. I'm not sure it's an honor, but mm -hmm. I think that there is a kind of social obligation that comes with being. A okay. member of these social groups mm -hmm. that means that you need to listen to the people who have who have power, mm -hmm. and I think this, of course, this isn't something that's specific or strange or unique to uh, to China or to how lineage groups or temple groups mm -hmm. or neighborhood associations are organized in China. I mean, you could think of uh, you know politically or socially influential people in your own neighborhood right. who might be you know they could be priests or you know rabbis or. Uh, just somebody who mm -hmm. has uh, become a kind of neighborhood leader because they're they're charismatic and energetic, right. um, and there's a certain amount of social pressure I think to listen to listen to people in these positions mm -hmm. of social authority. Right. Um, so I'm sort of looking at the, what's often the kind of the flip side of these social groups. I think 
Uh, in academia, we often think about civil society as uh, beneficial to democracy, mm -hmm. and I think that there uh, that that can that can be the case sure. uh, that these organizations can be used, you know, to mobilize people to hold political leaders accountable uh, when they don't behave well. The flip side of that, to that, though, is that these social groups can also be useful for political leaders when they want to get something done that doesn't always benefit local society. Mm -hmm. So, what happens when local society doesn't want to do what something what someone has suggested that they do? One of these uh, political leaders or the leader of the civil society. So the, the, the flip side to this is that, uh, that I argue that places that don't have strong civil society groups mm -hmm. or don't have strong uh, what I call infiltrating organizations, uh, which are more direct organizations actually set up by the Communist Party, so party cells, uh, small groups, which are mm -hmm. sort of the equivalent of like a neighborhood watch group, which is directly controlled and set up by the party. And these are also very useful direct mechanisms mm -hmm. of control through grassroots organizations. The flip side to this is when these organizations don't exist, it's actually almost paradoxically uh, easier for social groups to organize. So in the ac sort of absence of civil society, it's easier to get uh, leaderless protest. Okay. So this is something that I saw in, in a number of villages. So people who were, for example, unhappy with their land being requisitioned by the state, mm -hmm. you know, they weren't getting very good compensation. They didn't feel like in the long run this is a good deal for them. They wanted to hold on to the land that had been you know, in their family for, in some cases, over a dozen generations. Uh, so what did they do? Uh, they didn't have a local sort of civil society lineage association that would help them organize. So instead, they turn to sort of leaderless, quasi-leaderless methods of political organization. So, mm -hmm. Such uh, as what? So in the case of one village, uh, they, uh, a, a small group of villagers basically anonymously hung up posters all over the village saying, OK, let's all, we're all unhappy. They sort mm -hmm. of took the temperature of everybody, knew that everybody was unhappy, um, and hung posters up around the village uh, telling people, OK, we're going to meet here at, uh, at the village square at a certain time on a certain day. Uh, to put pressure on local leaders and protest and mm -hmm. protest against this, uh, protest against this land requisition. And how and does that work? I mean, how, what was the outcome? So the outcome was they got to keep their land oh, because okay. basically enough of the people in the village mobilized. I think um, something like eighty percent of the village actually ended up coming out to the wow. square, even though there wasn't there wasn't a kind of clear leader of this protest. Mm -hmm. It was just some anonymous citizen or group of citizens who was putting these posters up around the village. Mm -hmm. uh, enough people came out that higher levels of local government took notice and mm -hmm. saw what was going on in this village uh, and, and ended up halting, halting the land requisition. Mm -hmm. So people were able to get what they want by right, mobilizing, right. but it was helpful to, uh, to use this tactic of leaderless protest. Okay, so I guess my next question would be, were those people fearful that there would be any retribution by the government for coming out and basically saying that they were against what was happening? Well, I think there's, there's, power, in, there's power in numbers, right? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, they would have legitimately been fearful if there were a small number of people who were the clear leaders of this protest. And okay. then that does happen where it's, they're leaders of the protest, it's possible to identify who they are, and then they face pressure. Uh, the pressure could either be pressure from their family members mm -hmm. who might have jobs, government jobs, and are threatened to lose, they're be threatened to uh, lose their jobs if they don't pressure their own family to, to stand down. Or, you know, of course, they might be be jailed or beaten by the police mm -hmm. uh, if, if there are clear leaders of the protest. Right, okay. If it's leaderless, there are no leaders to target and put in jail. Uh -huh. And if you have 80% of, uh, of a town coming out to protest, is the government going to jail 80% of the people in the town? Mm -hmm. Clearly not. Right. Um, so it forces, it, to a certain extent, it can force uh, local governments to make concessions uh, if you mobilize enough Okay, people. so let's talk about what's going on in um, Hong Kong for the past six months. What's your take on that situation? So the dynamics in Hong Kong are, I mean, there, I think there's some interesting similarities to mm -hmm. what happens in mainland China. Of course, there are important differences. Uh, but the, so the important differences, really briefly, you know, Hong Kong mm -hmm. has been a sort of, uh, it's been a special administrative region of China since uh, since 1997, after the handover from, from the British. And so Hong right. Kong has been uh, guaranteed certain protections under the one country, two systems policy, uh, uh, especially greater civil liberty, liberties than, than exist in the mainland. So I think the, the protest uh, was originally motivated by a desire to try to hold on to these civil liberties. So the Hong Kong government had proposed an extradition law that people were worried would that allow uh, the uh, government in the mainland to then extradite 
uh, people who spoke out against it. So that was that was sort of what drove what drove these protests. One of the interesting things is the tactics used by the protesters and the tactics used by the government are, are quite similar to what happens in the mainland. Mm -hmm. So on the protester side, one of the reasons why these protests have succeeded is precisely they've, they've adopted this leaderless protest model that I described to you uh, right. as, as uh, happens in the, in the mainland. Um, in Hong Kong, it's a much more high-tech model than going and sort of pu putting up posters around a village. They're using encrypted social media apps right. like Telegram. To, to organize and uh, decide where to protest, decide what tactics to use. Uh, protesters are also using online forums to do this. And it's partly, uh, partly a reaction against what happened to an earlier wave of protests in 2014 when there were, uh, when there were clear leaders of this protest and then the state, the state targeted them, uh, right. as, often happens, mm -hmm. as often happens in the mainland. So how's the government responded? Well, so one of the tactics uh, I mean, obviously, the most important thing the government has respond is to use outright coercion, a ton of tear gas, uh, uh, rubber bullets, right. um, and, and arrests. At the same time, the government has also tried to use social organizations as a way to mobilize pro-government, pro-mainland support in a way that I think echoes what happens with these civil society groups in the mainland. So mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, these groups are, one type of group that has done this are native place associations. So these are uh, people who have uh, moved to Hong Kong or their ancestors maybe a generation or two before have moved to Hong Kong from a place in mainland China like Fujian uh, and then they set up associations just clubs right for uh, for people to organize and and the government to some extent has used these associations to mobilize people against uh, against the pro-democracy protesters and in support of of the mainland government. So this is a kind of inversion of what we usually think of mm -hmm. as you have a robust civil society, the civil society is going to strengthen democracy. In this case, at least one element of Hong Kong civil society uh, is being used to organize uh, in support of the government and against these pro-democracy mm -hmm. protesters. Okay, so what do, you, um, what do you think the future holds for the protesters? What do you think will end up happening? That's a good question. I mean, I mean I think there's no way to know for there's sure. No way to just, know, right? I'm just there's, wondering if you yeah. have any ideas. Well, I think that the protests in some ways have been quite, have been tactically innovative. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been, um, on, the, on the negative side, there's been uh, violence. And I think, you know, violence against people, which is, uh, which you can't really excuse, you know, violence uh, targeting people from the mainland. Um, I think there's also, there's also been a lot of property damage, which I think is, you know, ethically different. I mean, I think still maybe not something uh, that certainly in the West, in the tradition of nonviolent protests that people would, would advocate for, mm -hmm. but I think is at least distinct from violence against people. Um, but I think the great, uh, the great mass of protesters aren't violent towards people and aren't, aren't extremists, and their desire is basically for to protect the civil liberties uh, that they have. Mm -hmm. So they've adopted these innovative tactics of sort of leaderless protests using these apps. Um, and uh, some more sorts of innovative cooperative t uh, tactics on the ground. Uh, was the, the, the kind of motto, one of the mottos of the protests is be like water. So the idea is that the right. protesters kind of shift around mm -hmm. uh, so that the police can't surround them and, and kettle them and arrest them. Um, I think though that this, uh, that these sorts of tactical innovations which have worked to sustain this protest for a long time. So the mm -hmm. protests have going, been going on for for months now, mm -hmm. I mean, it outlasted the 2014 umbrella movement. It's outlasted the revolution in Egy Egypt. Has uh, outlasted the 1989 movement in in mainland China. Uh, but strategically, it's not clear to me where these protests are going and whether or not uh, I think that the protesters have su succeeded in pushing back and mm -hmm. and wringing concessions from the government. The government withdrew the extradition law that I talked about earlier, which was okay. the original impetus wow. for the protesters. Um, and so if they withdrew that, why are they still protesting? So the protesters actually have five, have five demands. Okay. Um, and so the government has, has essentially met one of them, but they did it kind of very, they did it in sort of slow motion in a way that I think didn't really satisfy uh, okay. very many people. Um, and so some of the other demands, like a demand for inquiry into police violence, uh, which I think is a demand that Beijing could potentially, could potentially meet if they mm -hmm. wanted to. Um, the resignation of the chief executive, um, which again is something that could potentially could potentially happen. Um, yeah, amnesty for for all of the uh, for the, the protesters who've been arrested, which I think is probably politically more difficult uh, for Beijing. Uh, and um, so I think that the uh, the fact that the government hasn't met these other demands, and especially the fact that the the, the amount of tear gas used, the amount of rubber bullets used, and the number of arrests has mobilized 
I think surprisingly, uh, the rest of Hong Kong to support these young protesters. So the, the frontline protesters are a lot of young people who are mm -hmm. college age or sometimes even younger, uh, maybe you know into their mid 20s. The surprising thing is that this protest, despite the violence, maintains high levels of support among the Hong Kong middle class. Uh, we see this in surveys, see this in the results of, uh, of, of elections mm -hmm. uh, that were held recently, which the uh, pro-democracy camp won mm -hmm. pretty resoundingly, and a big reversal for, for Beijing. Right, right. Uh, so the fact that they continue to have this support mm -hmm. in the, um, among a relatively broad swath of the Hong Kong population uh, means that I think we'll probably continue to see some level of mobilization. Right, right. Um, I think if the government was continue to make concessions, it might slowly, you might see a slow fading away. Mm -hmm. of okay. The protests. Interesting. So um, what would you like your readers to take away from your book? So a couple, I think two, two main things to take away from the book. I think the first is that when we think about how governments control societies, mm -hmm. we often think just about outright violence and coercion, or sometimes we think also about uh, the ways in which governments uh, generate legitimacy. So mm -hmm. in the United States and democracies, there's a lot of theory around how the democratic process generates a legitimacy so that people uh, think that the government's laws and policies are just and then comply with them. I think that there's a whole range of tactics that governments use in between this that are neither quite about legitimacy and are ne uh, nor are they uh, violent coercion, that are more sort of hidden forms of, of uh, coercion that get people to comply with the state. Mm -hmm. So that's the sort of main kind of theoretical takeaway. I mean, I think also in the bigger picture, I think the book, one of the things that I think I hope people take away from the book is that I think it's, a, it's also a, a hopeful book in a lot of ways. I, mean, I think it hopefully tells the story of a lot of people who uh, are able to get what they want uh, from their governments, uh, mm -hmm. in part by organizing under quite difficult, uh, quite difficult circumstances. So in the long run, so I'm I'm, uh, I'm a China optimist, uh, in both in uh, especially especially in the long run, and I hope that some of that, uh, some of the optimism comes out in the book. Okay, well this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for being here and sharing some of your work. Great, thank you for having me. For more information about Professor Mattingly and his research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.